No niin, hyvää huomenta vaan kaikille ja tervetuloa tähän Defconin aloitussessioon. My name is Mikko Hyppönen and we'll be doing the first session here talking about the uh, history and evolution of computer viruses. I'm from Finland. I've, uh, I've been playing around with viruses for the past 20 years, a little bit more than that. And uh, we are at an interesting point in history, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. And that's the main reason why I wanted to speak about the, the whole evolution of where we've been, where we are right now, and where we will be going with malware, trojans, backdoors, worms, viruses. Now, all those years I've been working with the same company, F-Secure, so we run antivirus labs around the world. And of course, in the early days, our operations were very small. A couple of guys in the lab, analyze everything by hand, reverse engineer the code, build detection, try to figure out how they spread. Today, all professional antivirus companies run massive labs around the world with automation, because we are, on a typical day, right now receiving somewhere in the range of 100 to 200,000 samples coming into our systems. So obviously, we can't keep up with normal human power anymore. But we'll start from Brain. So this is Brain. This is an original five and quarter inch floppy disk infected by Brain. And those of you who've uh, seen my TED talk, which came out around three weeks ago, I'll, you'll see the first five minutes maybe, some stuff you've seen before, but then we'll get into more, more interesting stuff. Because in my TED talk, I was also speaking about this. Last year, around November, we were cleaning our labs, and from one of the cupboards we found this box, which were full of five and quarter inch floppy disks. And that box had basically the first hundred PC viruses in it, including this, Brain.a. And Brain.a is considered to be, and it's known to be, the first PC virus in history. That's the first PC virus. We've seen before 1986, for, for example, some Apple II viruses and stuff like that. But this is actually important because we are still fighting PC viruses today, right? So I did the math. 1986, 2011, that's 25. It's going to be 25 years. And we had a meeting in the lab that, okay, what should we do about this? It's going to be 25 years since the first PC virus. And our media team thought that we should have some sort of social media campaign to raise awareness of computer security. And I thought that that's boring. What about if I uh, try to go and find the guys who wrote Brain 25 years ago? And if I find them, I'll speak with them and I'll ask them, like, you know, why did you do it? And what were you thinking? And uh, what do you think about what you started 25 years ago? And actually doing that, like trying to find virus authors 25 years later, typically would be impossible. In case of brain, it actually isn't. And I'll show you. I have the only Windows laptop in the world which actually has a floppy drive. <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> And here's the actual uh, boot code of a floppy infected by brain. So if you just take a closer look, you'll see that inside here, actually let me zoom so I can draw, right about here you'll see text, right? Welcome to the dungeon, 1986, Basit and Amjad. And Basit and Amjad are first names. They are Pakistani first names. And then there is a phone number and the street address. <laughs> so in February, <clears throat> I went to Pakistan. <laughs> this is from the west side of the city of Lahore, which is like 200 miles south from Abbottabad, which is where Bin Laden was caught. Didn't see him. I did see one funny guy with the long beard, but I don't think it was him. And this is from the road leading to this building, which is 730 Nissan Block, Alama Iqbal Town. And that's the address listed inside the brain code. So I knocked on the door. <laughs> you want to guess who answered the door? Basit and Amjad. They are still there. <laughs> so here, Basit standing up, Amjad, his brother, sitting down. Nowadays, these guys run a internet operator. Is it? telco operator for the city of Lahore. The company is called Brain Telecommunications. <laughs> so we had a very interesting chat about, okay, like, why did you do it? And what were you thinking? And, and 
Their explanation was that it was a proof of concept. These guys had a background uh, in, in Unix world. They had been running different mainframe systems in the early 1980s when they were like in their late teens, early, nine, uh, early 20s. And um, then PC DOS came around, 1985, and, and they hated it. They thought that it's like, it isn't as secure, and obviously it wasn't. And they decided to prove it by writing a virus, and that's what they did. And of course, they had no idea that the virus will go around the world, infect computers in more than 100 countries around the world, but that's what it did. They also started getting phone calls from around the world from people who got infected by the virus and all that. They really weren't expecting that to happen, but of course, it went global and became a global problem. Now, viruses like this were, I mean, brain was a very typical example of the early, early viruses we used to see back then. The motive wasn't anything very concrete. These guys wanted to try something out. They, they wanted to do something that would replicate and go around the world. And of course, around those days, 1986, 1987, 1988, viruses like Brain and Stone and Cascade and Yankee Doodle were all basically the same thing. They were spreading on floppy disks, infecting boot sectors, so you would have infected floppy inside your computer, you boot from the floppy, you get infected, and every other floppy you put in after that gets infected as well. Or file infectors like Yankee Doodle, which would infect those comp files, and then when you share files, well, it spreads from one computer to another. And these floppy infectors, I mean, what we have to remember, in 1986, we didn't have networks. I mean, normal computers, PC computers, were not connected to each other in any way. In fact, most computers didn't have a hard drive. They would typically have two floppy drives only, right? So if you wanted to move data around, you had to put it on a floppy. There was no other means of doing it. And that's why floppy-based infectors spread so quickly. Well, many of these viruses at the time are also, in one way or another, visual. What I mean by that is that you would typically know that you're infected. And one good example of that is, is the Omega virus. An Omega virus is actually, it's not important in any history books or anywhere actually um, to anyone else except to me. But it's important to me because it's the first virus I analyzed. In September 1991, we had a customer case of a large company, actually a telco, where they have damage on their computers and they were suspecting a virus and they sent us a sample. And I got assigned to look at the sample because around that time in F-Secure I was the only guy who would do reverse engineering and assembly language. And even that I actually had never done on PC. I had a background with Commodore 64 and doing assembly there. But, you know, go figure. I decided to do it and uh, printed out the code, spent a couple of days trying to go through and understand how it works and learning the interrupts of DOS system and all that. And I did it. I, I decoded it. I actually didn't have a spare PC I could infect at the time, so I actually couldn't run the code. I was just reading and trying to figure out what it does. And one of the things that I thought it did, just looking at the code, was that it would display on 13th of the month, if it was a Friday, it would activate and display one character, character number 232, I believe, uh, in ASCII chart. And I looked up the character, and uh, that is the Omega sign. So I named the virus Omega. That's the first virus I ever named, and the name stuck. I mean, if you Google around, you'll still find this virus as the Omega virus. And that actually started a, um, a tradition. And nowadays, in, in our company, once you've been 10 years with the company, you'll get a, uh, an Omega watch, like this. <laughs> so I should have named the virus Ferrari. <laughs> now, Many of you will remember viruses like Michelangelo at the time, which were destructive. So one way that you would know that you're infected by a virus is that it would destroy your files. Like Michelangelo would overwrite the first 100 sectors on your hard drive, destroying your fi file allocation table on DOS systems, and your PC wouldn't boot. Um, other examples were viruses which were visual. And let me, let me demonstrate that. <clears throat> so what we'll do is um, we'll boot up DOSBox, those of you who've uh, play old games will know this tool. It's basically a way of running old code on current, like this is a Windows 7 system. So let's mount some folders. Let's see. And what I have here is a collection of binaries, COM files, because if you look at the dates, 1993, 1994, and so. And these are all examples of virus code which at the time I, I 
modified slightly to remove all the destructive parts and uh, uh, replication parts. And what we're left with is basically the activation code. So for example, the vSign virus, <clears throat> which would infect your boot sectors, if I'm actually running the code right here, actually, I think it's like that. Yeah, that, here we go. It activates by drawing a V sign on your screen. That's why, I mean, that's why we call it the V sign virus, because you get a victory sign. So what I'm running right here is actually code from 1992, which is the original virus code, but everything else has just been knocked out except the visual parts of the virus. And many of the viruses at the time would do this. They would show themselves to the user. vSign would do this once a month. Once a month when you boot up your PC, it would draw this vSign on your screen. And we have plenty of these examples in here. For example, the um, Walker virus. Guess why it's called the Walker? Um, don't actually remember what the tequila virus does. Well, it draws a fractal, and that's, of course, not graphics, but uh, DOS-based uh, um, ASCII graphics with colors. Um, Alex, I think it's some sort of a demo effect. Yeah, that's pretty nice, actually. It, it, like, let's do that again. It was so nice, actually. There we go. Oh, pretty nice. Yeah. Um, you, know, you want to see more? We have, for example, the ambulance car, which is neat because it makes sound. <laughs> Except, well, it says dee da dee da dee da. It doesn't work right now for some reason. Let's do one more. Actually, I'll show you uh, something which actually does. All um, well, the crash wires look like this. You know, you know you're infected because it looks pretty bad. But, um, oh yeah, this is a good one coffee shop made in the Netherlands <laughs> but the one I actually tried to show is this one actual graphics like EGA or oh, maybe actually VGA graphics uh, the quotes um, um, someone I don't know Carl Sagan I believe so you would know that you're infected by a virus because you would get visual displays on your screen, or the virus would play games with you, like uh, Techoshi, which one day of the year when you boot up the PC, it won't boot, it ends in this screen, and then you have to type, happy birthday, Choshi, and then it continues. Well, apparently that's the nickname of the virus writer of the time. Um, actually, I want to go back to DOSBox and show one more example, which, which is a good example of the virus playing games with the user. Let's try with the casino virus. Here we go. Casino virus is neat. It actually um, takes a copy of your file allocation table to memory, then it overwrites it on your hard drive, right? So you just lost all your files because the file allocation table is gone. But it has a copy in RAM, right? And now it lets you play a game. You have five credits, and if you win, it's going to write the allocation table back to the drive. Right? <laughs> and if you just reset the machine, you lose because it, it has already deleted the stuff. So, and it explains this in detail to the user, and it actually lets you play. And if you win, it actually does what it claims. And we can actually play this right now. We have five credits. If we get five uh, pound signs, we win. So let's try. And that's the original code, so we might win or lose. It's not going to destroy my drive, but everything else is real, so we might win. No. Two credits. No. Sometimes you win. I've, I've won this game. And we lost. Oh. <laughs> so that's what I mean by viruses which play games with the user or at the very least make themselves known to the user. And this is an important difference to today's malware. Today when you get infected by malware you will not know that you're infected. You will not see funny images, your PC will not play music, your CD-ROM tray will not open and close all the time, nothing like that. I mean you will not know. It's running silently in the background. They won't even crash your systems nowadays. They're pretty well done. They're pretty compatible, won't slow down your system, won't take too much resources. They do testing on the virus code nowadays, so you won't actually see that you're infected like you used to see. The viruses started getting more and more advanced. Things like Mutation Engine, MTE, made by a Bulgarian virus writer who we knew at the time as Dark Avenger, uh, which was basically not a virus, but a kit that you could use to turn any other virus into polymorphic virus, so it en encrypted itself with different encryption every single time or VCL, Virus Creation Laboratory, which actually was the first one which had a user interface you could use to create viruses. 
So that's VCL. You just click on the menus, you click generate, and it makes a virus for you. And this is in 1992, so pretty advanced, 20, well, 19 years ago. And then comes Windows. First Windows viruses were written for Windows 3.0 in 1992. Very first one was called Vinvir, did nothing special. It was the first one capable of infecting the PE uh, file structure that Windows was using at the time. Um, other viruses of the time, Monkey, One Half, these are uh, mostly encrypting boot sector viruses. And then we get Concept in 1995, which is a virus that infects not your floppies, not your binaries, but it infects your documents. Concept actually infects Word documents using the VBA, uh, Visual Basic for Applications, scripting language inside Office at the time. And that's actually a big deal. Because if you think about what you do with your computers every single day, you, I mean, most computer users spend their days handling documents, creating and reading files, Excel sheets, Word documents, PowerPoint slides, what have you. And if sharing those, shares a virus, that's a big deal. And Concept became the most common virus in the world within the first 30 days since we found it. LaRue was a close follower. LaRue did not infect Word files, it infected Excel spreadsheet files. In fact, we later found a variant of LaRue which would not just infect your Excel spreadsheet, but it would also randomly round your random numbers inside your spreadsheets by zero 0.1% up or down once a day. So it would slowly corrupt the numbers you're working with. And that's, that's a pretty nasty attack because you will not notice the problem until it's been happening for quite a while, which means the data you're working with is bad, your backups are bad, I mean, there's no easy way to recover, there's no easy way to figure what it has changed and when. That's a big deal. Windows viruses were also uh, the early Windows viruses were often visual. I mean, they would show themselves. This is the Bosa virus written by a virus writing group from Australia, calling themselves Vlad. And that's the name of the group. That's the nickname of the guys in the group. Um, so viruses were still very much being done by hobbyists for fame, for challenge, just because they could. Um, another example is the Marburg virus from 1998, which would change your Windows desktop to look like this. So you would know you're infected. This was still the norm in the late 1990s. More Windows viruses, uh, Remote Explorer, Happy 99. And this one is actually important because Happy 99 is the very first email worm. We're talking about late 1998. This was an email worm which claimed to be a greeting card wishing Happy New Year 1999. It would actually show you fireworks on your screen. And while it's doing that, it would take your address book and email itself as an email which looks like you sent it to everybody listed in your address book. And the email contents were Happy New Year 1999, and there's an attachment called happy99.exe in it. And of course, your friends would believe you sent it, because it looks like you sent it. And they would open up the attachment, and they thought that that's what it's supposed to do. And it would replicate, and replicate, and replicate. And these kind of email worms quickly became the biggest problem we have. And one thing which feels funny now is that you could actually do that. I mean, you could just take a binary, like an executable, and email it to someone else, anywhere else in the world, and they would get it, no problem. And they could run it, no problem. Obviously, you can't do that anymore. Filters would kill any, I mean, if I tried emailing an EXE Windows binary to every single one of you, I don't think any of you would actually get it. I mean, my operator, your operator, or your firewall, or whatever, would kill off an executable attachment nowadays. But that wasn't the case back then. So more Windows viruses at the time. Um, Melissa became um, one of the largest outbreaks in history because it combined these two big trends at the time. It combined an email worm with a macro virus infecting Word documents. So it would send itself as an email, which looks like it's coming from you once you get infected, sending it to all of your contacts in your address book, and the attachment is not an executable, it's a doc file, it's a Word document file. In fact, it's one of your own Word document files which has been infected with a macrovirus. And this has two problems. First of all, you are going to infect your friends. Second of all, it leaks confidential information. It takes a doc file from your hard drive, infects it, and sends it out to thousands of people. And that file could be anything. It could be Plans, patent applications, a love letter, who goes? I mean, anything. Love letter, this is 
still in the history books as one of the largest single email outbreak. Uh, and it probably will stay as the largest email outbreak, or one of them, uh, because we don't see email outbreaks anymore. This was one of the problems which has, has gone away. In fact, here's a uh, screenshot from CNN.com at the time. Uh, I'm actually here making uh, an, a, an estimate that no, it's not going to be a big problem. Of course, I was completely wrong. It became one of the largest outbreaks in history. Uh, there you go. Whoopsie. Anna Kornikova, I'll just pick this one as an example of the, of, of the email worms at the time. Many of these would simply just try to fool the user into opening up an attachment. And Anna Kornikova uh, was an email worm which claimed that it has an image of Anna Kornikova. And here's an example of an email. And those of you who don't remember, Anna Kornikova used to be a tennis player, a pretty tennis player. So the, this is the email they would send. Here you have, that's the subject field, and then the content. Hi, check this, annakornikova.jpg.vbs. And VBS is Visual Basic Script, a Windows system, which it's executable, but almost scripting executable. And we actually had um, quite a large outbreak on this virus. And we had people calling our labs. I actually spoke with one guy myself, and he told me that, yes, he received the email, and he heard in the radio news that it's a worm, so he knows it's a worm. And our product actually, I mean, our antivirus actually blocked it, so he's safe. But he still wanted to see the picture. Like, how could he... <laughs> Basically, how could I disable your antivirus so I could just click on it? <laughs> and of course, it didn't, didn't actually show you any images. I mean, I just picked this because well, she's a pretty girl, but... When you actually clicked on the VBS file, it would just replicate further. You wouldn't actually see any images. I, I believe I told the guy to just, you know, we already had web at the time. I told him to go online and find some pictures. Maybe that's the easier way out. <laughs> more viruses of the time. Maybe this one is more important than others. This was one of the first um, Windows network share replicating virus, um, NIMDA, which got its name from admin, which, which well, that's why it's named. Um, and NIMDA was, uh, there was lots of conspiracy theories at the time, because NIMDA was found in 2001, in September 2001, exactly one week after the terrorist attacks. And there were lots of conspiracy theories that this uh, it was somehow related, but it never actually proved anything either way. Nowadays, looking back, I don't think it was related in any way, but everybody was pretty paranoid at the time. More viruses, and now these are all email, Windows email replicating viruses. Um, Sven is a good example on, on the kind of social engineering tricks they were using. Here's an email sent by Sven, and uh, it looks like it's an email coming from Microsoft. So sender is MS Technical Assistance. Uh, it explains that, you know, there's new patches, and this is in 2003, so we didn't have Microsoft updates yet. You, you didn't have automatic updates. If you wanted to patch your system, you had to download a patch file, an executable file, and run it. So this used that trick to its, its, its benefit. Looks fairly convincing. Looks like a real uh, Microsoft email. And there's a file. You can see it there in the top. Q something that exe attached into it. And that is the naming convention Microsoft used at the time for patches. And it, it's especially handy because it, it, the, the message explains to you that this is a security update for September 2003. And it would actually get the current date. So when this virus kept on replicating for a number of years, it would always speak about you know, the current month and the current year. If you would run Sven today, it would speak about August 2011, cumulative patch. So it felt pretty real. And that's one of the reasons why it became such a big problem. And this is also one of the viruses where the virus author was caught, a Swedish guy, um, was caught and sentenced for some sort of online disruption based on Swedish laws at the time. But then things started changing. We entered the years of internet worms or web worms like Code Red. Code Red did not infect Windows workstations. Code Red infected Windows servers. It specifically infected Windows web servers running IIS. Using a remote exploit, it would infect those servers and immediately continue replicating from that infected server. It would just scan IP ranges, trying to find more servers, and then use, using the remote exploit, infect them. You can actually see how quickly such a replication mechanism goes worldwide. Um, this is basically 20, the first 24 hours in the replication of Code Red. 
and it started getting copycats of various kinds, including Slapper and Slammer and Blaster and Sasser. Um, most of these targeting Windows workstations using remote exploits in LSASS or in RPC or some other network visible uh, resources of Windows. And we have to remember 2004, most Windows users were not running a firewall. I mean, if they were online, even if they were inside a company, most likely they had open ports all the way to the internet, which now feels pretty weird, but that's, that's the situation at the time. So you had port 139 or port 445 TCP open to the, anybody could connect to it from anywhere in the world. And if, and if there were remote exploits, they could exploit them. And they did. And that's how, for example, Sasser spread. So if you think about that, you, got, you have one infected PC and it just starts scanning either random IP addresses or just one by one. Like try to go all, through all IP4 addresses. And you know, IP4 addresses we don't have. I mean, we have. 4.3 billion IP addresses, which is perfectly scannable. You can scan them all. Many of these, I mean, most of these weren't scanned, every single IP address in the world. And of course, they'll find empty addresses, like addresses which route nowhere. So there's nothing to infect. Or they'll find an address which has a computer, but it's a wrong kind of a computer, like it's a Mac. A Windows worm won't be able to infect it. Or it finds a right kind of a computer, like, you know, a Windows computer, but it's blocked. It's, I mean, behind a firewall or some sort of routing protection, so you can't connect. Or it's already patched, so the patch that the, or the vulnerability has already been closed by the user. But as you can guess, if it just keeps on scanning and keeps on scanning, eventually it will find a computer which is the right kind of a computer, which is not behind a firewall, which has not yet been patched. And in that case, of course, it will infect that computer. And it will immediately start replicating further from that computer. In fact, they are now both scanning the whole public IP ranges, and it gets faster and faster, and this explains why we got these massive spreading speeds, including uh, Slammer, which was later proven that it scanned the whole IP, IP4 IP, uh, address range in less than 20 minutes from the moment when it was started. And that's pretty remarkable. In 20 minutes, all of us who were online in 2003, it scanned our computers, it scanned our mobile phones, if we had mobile phones with internet connectivity at the time. And to the end user, you would typically know that something like this was happening because you get some sort of a crash on your system. Um, Slammer, uh, uh, Blaster and Sasser, for example, would cause a um, system shutdown because they would remotely crash RPC or LSASS in, in Windows at the time. So the end user would see that there's a problem. His PC would shut down. He would have 60 seconds of time to save his data and then it would shut down. He would reboot and he would most likely see it again in a minute or two, or maybe in 10 minutes, maybe in half an hour. Depends on when the next time someone else is, is scanning his IP address. So let's think about this. You are an end user. You start seeing this regularly on your PC. You can't work because your PC keeps rebooting. What are you going to do? Well, you ask around. Look, what should I do? My PC reboots. Somebody will know that, yeah, it's a virus. All right. What should I do? Well, you should patch the hole, patch the RPC vulnerability or the LSASS vulnerability. All right, how do I patch it? Well, you go to Microsoft.com and you find the patch, you download it, you run it. Okay, let's do that. We have here Microsoft download pages from 2003. That's the actual patch for uh, the RPC vulnerability MS-039. Uh, Click download, excellent. We get an executable file. Let's download it on our desktop. Here we go, and now we're downloading it. Excellent. And of course, this takes a while, which means it's more than likely that you'll actually get <laughs> While you're downloading it, you get the same, same error message. And now you have two counters on your screen at the same time. You have the countdown from 60 seconds to zero of reboot, and you have the download counter, like how many percentages of the actual patch you've downloaded. So you're basically running a game or, or a race, like who's going to be first. And this game was being run on, on thousands and thousands of computers around the world. And of course, most of the users lost the game. They didn't get the patch before it rebooted again. Very, very frustrating. And these are the kinds of problems that led Microsoft to change their, uh, the way they look into security. 2003, they uh, did the big overhaul code review of Windows base code and started taking security seriously. This resulted first in Service Pack 2 for Windows XP, later into what we have today, in, for example, in 64 with Windows 7, which actually has a decent security model. So it, this was the basic reason why um, security in Windows world regarding problems like these were finally taken seriously. And the problems we saw at the time were serious. Here's the uh, packet loss chart of the whole internet um, 
during the hours when the slammer worm started spreading. Typical packet loss globally, 1 to 2 percent, then suddenly jumps to 20, 30 percent. Massive problems. So we started getting denial of service problems on systems which weren't infected themselves, but they were in the same networks with infected systems and the packet generation that they saw was so massive that we started seeing problems with critical infrastructure. So in 2003, I wrote down some of the things we saw, thanks to Slammer and Blaster and Sasser. We had air traffic control problems, we had ATM networks down, we had 911 services down, we had infected uh, nuclear plants in USA in 2003 because of uh, Sasser. Uh, flight problems, government systems infected, Heathrow Airport, check-in systems infected, a couple of screenshots I took at the time. Air Canada couldn't operate because they were infected by Sasser, I believe. In fact, here's a picture from their check-in. Anybody spot the blue screen? Right there. And it wasn't just computers. I mean, normal computers at the time. Um, for example, the uh, automation gear started getting affected. Here's a screenshot from uh, CSX that I took in uh, August 2003. Those of you who don't know, CSX is one of the largest railroad operators here in USA. If you look, what they announced is that they had an in in-house infection which resulted in a slowdown of major applications, including dispatching and signal systems. As a result, passenger and freight train traffic was halted immediately, including the morning commuter train service in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. So, trains around the capital of the United States of America stopped in the middle of the day, in the middle of their tracks, because of a computer virus. This actually happened in 2003. And things like this were the wake-up call. And then, of course, we had infections in things like these. We had a large case of infected forest tractors because they run windows and they got infected because they had GPRS connections. They were actually sending uh, embedded geeks in tractors in the middle of the forest to find, because they wouldn't boot up. They couldn't operate these once they got infected. And they were like, typically far away in forests and you had to somehow rescue them from there. And then we had cases like these. This is a screenshot from a Swedish Aftonbladet magazine explaining that this hospital in uh, Vestra Götaland had in-house infection with 5,000 computers infected, which is bad. But what's even worse is that also these got infected. They're x-ray systems, which were running windows. And they actually had patients uh, put into ambulance cars and driven to other hospitals to be taken care of because they had infections in their hospital systems at the time. But something even more important was about to happen. 2003, a virus called Fizzer, which I claim nobody here remembers. And I also claim it's one of the most important viruses in history. Because Fizzer was the first virus we would conclusively prove that from the very beginning this virus was written for one motive only, and that motive was money. So before 2003, everything we saw was written for fun, for challenge, for lulls for kicks, right? Nobody tried to make money with viruses until Fizzer. And the way Fizzer tried to make money is by sending spam. So it would infect computers, build a proxy network out of them so you could reroute proxy or email uh, traffic through them, and that, that service was then sold to spammers. And this is something we still, still see today. Spam, email spam still exists, and it's still being sent through infected home computers. And obviously there's money to be made out of this. Very quickly, many of the hobbyist virus writers of the time realized that they could actually use their skills to make money by cooperating with spammers, by starting to steal passwords with keyloggers, starting to steal credit card details when people from infected computers were doing online purchases and typing in their uh, usernames and passwords. And very quickly, we also started seeing the shift, uh, geographical shift, on where viruses were coming from. In the good old days, before viruses turned into money-making machines, they were mostly done in developed Western nations, like Europe, USA, Canada, Japan, Australia. Today, the biggest hotspots are Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Romania, Moldova, um, China, obviously, and South America, especially Brazil, which is the biggest source of banking Trojans, which steal money during online banking. And the virus riders themselves changed. Um, we had completely new kinds of, of, of online criminals getting onto the net and, and doing this. Here's examples of caught virus writers from the 1990s, including on the top right corner, Mr. Chenning Hao, who wrote the um, love, um, CIH, aka the Chernobyl virus. 
And then here's some caught virus writers after 2003. You see any difference? So they became much more organized, much more professional. The guy at the uh, bottom left, Mr. Tariq Al Daur, was actually using uh, keyloggers to steal credit card numbers, and they were then laundering money from those credit card numbers by putting them into online poker games and losing money on purpose from the credit card numbers to accounts that they controlled, and then they could move them back to the real world. And what they did is that they laundered close to 2 million euros, and that money was then used to purchase gear, gear like um, hiking boots, tents, sleeping bags, knives, GPS uh, navigators, plane tickets, and all this was shipped to um, Iraq, to the insurgents fighting, uh, fighting over there. So what we have here, for example, is a uh, link between online crime, viruses, Trojans, backdoors, and funding the insurgents in Iraq. So some of the viruses that then started to make headlines, money-making viruses, Sobic, Witty, Maidu, Bagel, these were spam-generating viruses mostly. Um, and then open source uh, bots, like SDBot, which actually the, the code, source code of SDBot is licensed under GNU public license, and we've seen tens of thousands of variants of this throughout the years. We probably still see versions of SDBot being made today, like eight years later. And other typical bots uh, or botnet um, uh, creating bots at the time. So you would have a number of infected machines and they could all be controlled centrally, creating a botnet which could be used not just to send spam but also do banking trojan attacks and, and credit card theft and stuff like that. And then we got Sony. <laughs> now, Sony gets a lot of hate and they get it for a good reason. They've been doing bad stuff for a number of years. Um, I think it pretty much really started with the rootkit that they were shipping on One Cent and Switch Food and Celine Dion music CDs. So if you would buy a Celine Dion music CD and listen to it on your CD player, no problem, but if you put it inside your computer, it would auto run an installer which would install a DRM code on your system, no questions asked, no prompting, nothing, it just installs a DRM system, and then it installs a rootkit, a Windows rootkit which hides the DRM. And in fact, it doesn't just hide the DRM, it hides any file or any folder which starts with specific characters, basically uh, dollar underscore dollar, I believe, or something like that. Which means, yes, you could hide a DRM, but you could hide also anything else. And viruses very quickly started naming their binaries with dollar underscore dollar. Because if a computer which had been used to, inf uh, to listen to Celine Dion got infected, Sony would now hide the virus. And it would hide it so well that pretty much none of the antivirus programs at the time could scan the files anymore. They would be just gone. And of course, some would claim that if you listen to Celine Dion, you deserve to get infected. <laughs> but I'm not saying that. But there were in interesting uh, um, comments coming out of Sony at the time, especially um, a person called Thomas Hesse, president for Sony BMG um, International. He, he made an, uh, a quote which was so cool we actually printed t-shirts out of it. Most people don't even know what a rootkit is, so why should they care about it? <laughs> and that's a great quote, isn't it? If they don't know what it is, I mean, most people don't even know what the brain damage is, so why should they care about it? <laughs> then we started seeing more and more rootkits, not just from Sony, but I mean, from traditional virus writing gangs who wanted to make, uh, hide their, uh, their malicious code better. Hackstore basically was a kit which you could use to hide any other uh, binary or processes or registry keys or open ports. Then more viruses at the time, Stormworm, many will still remember from 2007. In fact, I believe we have, yeah, here's a video clip shot in our lab showing the uh, spread of Stormworm. This, we, we run this system which just illustrate where we blocked viruses. And if you look at the top corner, the time is ticking away. It's uh, getting close to midnight and pretty much around midnight, the outbreak of storm starts. So watch carefully. The system is now normal. That's what it looks normally, right? Now it's 11 p.m. and uh, here we go. Well, that's what an outbreak 
looks like. That's a decent outbreak. Globally, pretty much everywhere where you have connectivity, anywhere where you have computers, uh, massive infections. Greenland looks great. No viruses in Greenland. So. <laughs> and now it's over. I mean, it took like uh, maybe seven hours. That's a typical outbreak, um, the kind of outbreak we used to see back then. And then we had Mebrut. Um, Mebrut, which probably for a number of years stayed as the most advanced malware we've ever seen. Now we have two contenders for the same title. But Mebrut, when we first found it, it was all related to this. Which movie is this? Matrix, no? Matrix 2, that's correct. Matrix 2. There actually is a Matrix. There's, I even heard there's a Matrix 3, but I haven't seen it. What, what is she called? What's her name? Monica Bellucci, very good. She plays the part of Persephone in the movie. Why am I showing her? Because she's gorgeous, that's right. <laughs> but this is the website of uh, Monica Bellucci, uh, monicabellucci.it in Italy, she's Italian. And this was one of the first, if not the very first website that we saw that was used to spread Mebro. So we entered the days of drive-by downloads. You would get infected by just browsing the web. And now, today, this is the number one way of getting infected. Email and email worms haven't been the main problem for a number of years. It's the web. You browse the web, there's an injected JavaScript line there which goes through your, all your plugins in your browser, including Java and QuickTime and uh, Flash and what have you, tries to find an old version. If you have an old version, it will pop it and you're infected. That's exactly what this page did. It was one of the first cases where we saw it happening. And what Meprod actually did is that it installed itself to the master boot record of the infected computer, which is pretty much exactly what Brain did, except at Brain time we didn't have hard drives, so it only went to the boot sector of the floppy. This actually goes to the boot sector of your hard drive, the, the first master boot, boot record. And that's pretty hard to do under Windows, but it did it. And, and even more remarkably, um, I think it's a good example of how advanced these uh, viruses started to become, is that um, obviously when you're running below Windows, boots before Windows boots. You run the risk of crashing Windows, but it almost never did. It was very well tested. And, and if it did, I mean, if, if something went wrong, and then you actually ended up with a, <coughs> with a Windows blue screen. Now, obviously, Windows is crashed. Windows is no longer running, but Mebroot was still running. And in this case, Mebroot would make a diagnostic dump of the crashed computer and send it back to the virus writers over the internet so they could debug and figure out why it crashed. No? <laughs> Remote. Uh, quality assurance for malware, right? Configure, the biggest outbreak of 2009, still remains one of the biggest mysteries we have in the history of viruses. Massive, massive infection, which wasn't used to do anything at all. And then we started finding even more advanced. Uh, if Mebrut was advanced, um, this is pretty much the state of the art nowadays. TDSS, or aka Alureon, um, rootkits which are today capable of infecting a 64-bit uh, Windows 7 in the MBR, booting all the way from the MBR, surviving the Windows boot, regardless of all the, all the uh, security features that were introduced in Windows 7. Pretty remarkable stuff. Uh, the amount of infected machines around the world right now with this is in the millions, and it's being used for different kind of uh, money-making scams. It's one of the biggest problems we have at the moment. But that was still quite different from, from these ransom trojans that we started seeing as well. By this time, like I explained earlier, most of the infections were invisible. You wouldn't know that you're infected. But then we started seeing uh, trojans like GP code, which were very visible. What GP code does is that it infects your system, then it waits for the PC to be idle so that you're not at the computer, and then it starts encrypting your hard drive goes through your hard drive, encrypts everything, and then it changes the Windows wallpaper to this message where it explains that, you know, all your files have now been encrypted. If you want to get your files back, please read the how to decrypt TXT file. And when you read the how to decrypt TXT file, it explains to you in detail that, yep, we just encrypted your files using RSA 1024 with an AES key, and uh, if you want to get your files back, please uh, actually email us here, FileMaker at savemail.net, and send us 125 bucks through a uCache prepaid system and provide this unique key, which is unique to your system, and they will provide you with the decryptor. And they actually will. Uh, we've worked with multiple cases where affected users have sent them money and have gotten the decryptor back. 
And as much as I hate the idea of anybody sending any money to these clowns, I know the people have done it and they have gotten their files back. And this is this is a pretty nasty way of, of, of making money with malware. And it's also, I mean, typically when we would find an email address like this, which we know is being used by online criminals, we would shut it down. We haven't shut this one down. This email address still works today because we know there are users out there who need to be able to send money to criminals because they need their files back because they don't have backups. And of course, what you should have is backups. Many of these cases have actually been corporate users where not just a corporate laptop has been encrypted, but also network shares have been encrypted. And then they learn that they actually don't have good backups and they have a big problem and they would be more than happy to pay $125 to get their files back. But all this work with malware like this did not prepare us for what we would find next. And that was Stuxnet. Stuxnet, which was found in summer of 2010, uh, Stuxnet, which had been around spreading in the wild already for a year. And that's actually remarkable. And that's actually embarrassing to us. I mean, us antivirus vendors and us security companies. We missed Stuxnet for a freaking year. Nobody saw it going around. Eventually, when it was found, it already had done what it wanted to do. And of course, as we know by now, Stuxnet was written by you guys, and you guys, I mean the Americans, the US government. <laughs> and uh, it was a successful operation. It wanted to disrupt the NATO's nuclear enrichment plan in Iran, and it did. In fact, we believe it, was, it already did what it wanted to do in 2009. So by the time it found it in 2010, it didn't actually matter anymore. It had already done what it did. So let's, let's, let's look at that a little bit closer. We have, obviously, computers everywhere, in, in factories, in plants. You go to any chemical plant, any power plant, any food processing plant, you look around, it's, it's all being run by these. That's a Siemens S7400, a typical PLC programmable logic controller. And for example, the elevators in this building most likely run PLCs, or maybe STU, something along these lines. Automation, which isn't running Windows, isn't running, um, it's actually running, Siemens gear is running 32 uh, with Linux inside very fault-tolerant systems, and um, the way they are being programmed is typically from Windows workstations, and that's the route in. I mean, Stuxnet will infect pretty much any Windows computer in the world, but it won't do anything except replicate unless the computer has the Siemens Step 7 programming environment installed, and that's the environment you use to program these. And even if, if it finds Step 7 running on the computer, it won't do anything unless it's connected to the right kind of a PLC. It has to be Siemens S7417 or, or another model. If it finds the right PLC, then it will reprogram the PLC. And now it waits for somebody to disconnect the PLC from the computer and take it to a factory floor. And it still won't do anything unless it's connected exactly the right kind of gear. And it's looking specifically these. These are high-frequency power converters manufactured by a company called Vacon. It's looking for a specific number of the right kind of high-frequency uh, high power converters. And of course, these, we believe, were the converters that were used to spin the centrifuges in the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant. So the real target becomes not just the high-frequency power converters, but the whole nuclear program, or the nuclear enrichment program. So it has been a pretty wild ride. If we look at the last 25 years, from brain spreading on five and quarter inch floppy disks to Stuxnet, which is more than a megabyte of code, multi-million dollar project, more than 10 man years in the making, targeting completely undocumented, tailor-made systems, um, infecting PLCs, which has never been done before. It's been amazing change what we've seen. Many things have changed. At the same time, many things haven't changed. For example, St uh, brain never spread over the internet because we didn't really have internet in 1986 as we have it today. Um, Stuxnet doesn't spread over the internet. It spreads on, on USB sticks. Why? Because the systems it wants to reach are not on the internet. Well, obviously nuclear systems are not online. They are separated. That's why it spreads on USB sticks. Brain was actually a rootkit. If you tried to read the infected boot sector, you wouldn't see it. It would redirect the read attempt and give you the original boot sector instead. Stuxnet as a rootkit to hide itself, not just on the infected Windows computer, but also on the infected PLC. So everything has changed, and nothing has changed. And it will be interesting to see what kind of viruses we will be analyzing 25 years from now. Thank you very much.